there's three basic ways that we can test for connectivity between an end user and the SQL Server. Two of these are going to be built into Windows, but only one of them is going to be available on every Windows box within your environment. So the first way to test for database connectivity, and the simplest way, is to use the telnet command. Telnet command simply checks to make sure that the socket is open and available, and that there's no firewalls in the way. If you can't telnet to the TCP port that the SQL Server is listening on, then no application is going to be able to connect on that TCP port either. The second option is going to be to use the ODBC Connection Manager. By doing this, we're simply going to create a new ODBC connection within the Connection Manager, and it's got a test functionality at the end of the wizard. The third option is to use the SQL CMD. This is going to test to make sure we can actually not only make the connection and log in successfully, but run queries of our choosing against the database engine. Telnet is not going to be available on every one of the machines within your environment, unfortunately. Starting in Windows Vista, the Telnet client is an optional component which is not installed by default. So if you're in an environment that's still running Windows XP, the good news is that the Telnet application is going to be available to all your machines. Anything newer than Windows XP, and you'll need to install Telnet manually. The ODBC Connection Manager will always be available on every computer within your environment that's running Windows. That is the beauty of the ODBC Connection Manager. You can always use it to test for connectivity. SQL CMD will only be available on machines where the SQL Server management tools have been installed. Let's go ahead and take a look at how we actually use these tools. So the first thing I want to look at is actually the ODBC Connection Manager. In this case, I've got the 64-bit Connection Manager up. It'll look exactly the same if you're running on a 32-bit platform or a 64-bit platform, and it works exactly the same in both platforms, and it works the same from Windows XP all the way up through Windows Server 2012, which, as you can see, this is. We can either create a user DSN, a system DSN, or a file DSN. Depending on what permissions the user has when they log in will determine which of these tabs are visible or available. All of them provide the exact same functionality. As long as you can get to one of those tabs and click the Add button, you're good to go. So we click Add, we get a list of drivers to use. In this case, I've got the SQL Server driver and the SQL Server native client 11.0. The SQL Server driver is the old traditional SQL Server driver. This is for SQL Server 2000 and below. The SQL Server native client is the new driver. So in this case, I've got the SQL Server 2012 driver installed. I'm going to test with the new SQL Server native client 11.0 driver. Now it says finish, but I'm not actually finishing. I'm actually simply launching a new wizard. I don't know why that button says finish. It always has. We click in the name field. We can give it a simple name. I'll just call mine test. And we can select the server we want to connect to. In this case, we're going to connect to the server AG2. That's a remote SQL server within my environment. I can either click finish at this point, and I'll be prompted with the connection wizard, but I may need to give more information. So I can click next. I can use integrated Windows authentication. I can specify a separate SPN if I need to, or if I'm testing for SQL authentication to make sure I've got my username and password correct, for example, I could collect SQL Server authentication. I'm going to use Windows authentication for this example. I simply click Next. I can select the Change the Default Database to option. And from the drop down menu, I can select Database. Now, the reason this drop down pops up is because at this point, I've actually already tested connectivity to my database. It has queried this list of databases from my SQL Server engine running on AG2. I'm going to leave it at the master database for right now. If I need to specify a mirror, I can do so here. I don't need to simply to test for connectivity. This would be more if I was creating an ODBC connection that I was going to use in a production application. I don't need to worry about these other settings because I'm not going to be using them per se in my test because I'm not worried about specific ANSI settings or application intent settings. Because again, all I'm doing is just testing basic connectivity. We click Next. We can change another variety of settings that we don't really need to worry about to simply test connectivity. You can see now the button is changed to Finish. We click Finish, and we get a basic summary information. If on the first screen of this wizard we had clicked Finish, we would have been brought to this same screen. We then have this nice test button. 
We click test and it makes a connection to our SQL server, runs a sample query, and completes successfully. If we had gotten an error message, the error message would show up here and it would show test failed. Let's go ahead and see how Telnet can be used to test for connectivity. The Telnet command is fairly basic. We simply run Telnet space, the server we want to connect to, and then the port number we want to connect to. Now by default, default instances of SQL Server are going to listen on port 1433. So if we run that command, it is going to attempt to connect to port 1433. Now at this point, I have a successful connection. It may look like there's a problem, but there's actually not. A blinking cursor in a black screen is exactly what we're looking for. This tells us that I've made a TCP socket connection, and I can now send commands to the SQL Server. Because I'm not sending actual T-SQL commands, and these are not encapsulated in any sort of T-SQL wrapper, SQL Server is going to simply ignore my commands and reject my connection and not let me do anything damaging. I can hit Control and then the left square bracket, and that's going to drop me out to a Microsoft Telnet command line window. Typing quit then gets me out of that window. Now, let's see what it looks like when the server is not there, when the SQL service has been stopped on the remote machine. So to do this, use the SC command to stop the service. And I can't stop the service because of the dependencies of the SQL Server agent. So let's go ahead and stop the SQL Server agent. And then we can stop the SQL Server on the remote machine. So let's go ahead and test this connectivity again. Now it's going to take a little while to fail, but it is going to fail because there's nothing on the remote machine. Could not open connection to the host on port 1433, connect failed. Now this doesn't tell me specifically what the problem is, it just tells me that there's a problem. Obviously we know what the problem is, the SQL server is not running on the remote machine. This could indicate a problem with the firewall, it could indicate a network connectivity problem, it could indicate that the server is down. We would need to fix whatever that problem is and then run our test again. So the last command we can use is the SQL CMD command. So by default, when you run SQL CMD, it's going to connect to your local machine. In this case, I want to connect to the remote machine, so I specify the dash S parameter, specify the server name of AG2, and press enter. By default, it's going to use Windows Authentication to try and connect. Now, when it fails, which again will take a minute or so, it's going to give me some actual information. It doesn't specifically tell me that the SQL Server is not there and that's my problem, but it does tell me that a network related or instance specific error has occurred while establishing a connection. SQL Server not found or not accessible. Check if instance name is correct and if SQL Server is configured to allow remote connections. So it could either be a configuration option, or it could be that the SQL Server is not there, or again, a network connectivity problem. In this case, again, we know that the SQL Server is simply not up and running, and that is the problem. If we were to start the SQL Server service, and then try SQL CMD again, it would simply let us in. Again, nothing on the screen that's indicating error indicates success. We get a one and a caret indicating we can now run T-SQL queries against the system. So if we want to know what's going on in the box, a simple query to run is to simply select the list of databases that are running on the server. We do select name from sys.databases, we run go, and then we get a list of all the databases on the server. So we know that we are actually running commands successfully against the SQL server. If SQL CMD can connect to the database, anything should be able to connect to the database. So to summarize all this, we want to start with Telnet. Telnet is going to give us the most basic information, but it's a quick and dirty test that will pretty much always succeed. If Telnet's not installed on the end user system, it's fairly easy to get it installed. Always check the SQL Server error log for any sort of server-side error that's being thrown. When login errors are being thrown to the end user, they may or may not be returned to the SQL Server error log as well. If they're not, then the user probably isn't connecting to the SQL Server directly. If they are, then they are getting connected and there's some sort of other problem, possibly a username or password problem. It would require more troubleshooting at that point to see what the actual problem is. Once you've completed testing with Telnet, 
and you've checked the error log, then move on to other applications, like the ODBC Connection Manager and the SQL CMD command line tool.